Uh, good morning, everyone. And I want to just take this opportunity to thank Vince Sant and Jean Philippe for inviting the University of Notre Dame to join this very important project and myself specifically to talk about innovative strategies for dengue control. When I first saw the topic that you requested, I was very excited because I think there's wonderful, great mindset work around the world for um, developing new innovations. But then I quickly became anxious by thinking, I'm not a subject expert and only one that I'm going to be presenting today. And I want to make sure I don't offend anybody. So there's a disclaimer. It will be very high level. Uh, and this is basically the structure of the presentation. The need for innovation, we've mentioned this before, but it's worthwhile to be purposefully redundant. I'll just give some examples. Uh, dengue virus control assessment. How am I deciding on which innovation uh, to, to give examples about? There's a couple of, of strategies that actually have already been put in place for assessing those tools available and where we need to go. And then I'll list out some innovation examples and then again um, end with some challenges and requirements for any of the strategies that we talk about. So Vincent mentioned this already and I think uh, many people are aware, but we are very limited with the number of chemicals available for recommended for safe use uh, by WHO for dengue specifically, and malaria is no different, and the majority of the chemicals available today are pyrethroids for dengue control. And for malaria, you only, you only have four chemical classes, pyrethroids dominating those. So the, the mode of action is similar, which of course is one of the reasons why we have resistance. There's many, but that's one. The selection pressure is high, and the cross resistance um, does not help. The delivery mechanisms for these chemicals too, Vincent mentioned uh, space spraying for adult control and habitat treatment sanitation for, for larval control is, is also limiting. So it's not just the chemicals or the biocontrol, uh, bioactives available, but it's also the delivery and distribution of vector control strategies that are also being explored for innovation to help with resistance management as well. We have mentioned the focus, of course, is urban epidemics. That should be because that's where the highest burden is. So we think of Aedes aegypti. We also can put in there Aedes albopictus. But I do want to continue to remind everyone that dengue ecology is much broader than urban epidemics. And if we want to achieve dengue prevention and control according to the WHO goals, we do need to also consider strategies for the sylvatic vectors which are not the cause of urban epidemics, but they certainly will introduce the underlying uh, foundation for a continued transmission and introduction of new serotypes potentially in, in environments. So while we do uh, focus, of course, on Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, there are many others that are uh, responsible for dengue transmission that we should be aware of. Then Sand, I think, showed a map very similar to this. This is from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. It's the dengue map. This is just from the last three months. It's the number of cases, at least, that are being reported, uh, the alerts for, for dengue uh, and around the world. And this just kind of reflects what I just mentioned, that the ecology is, is very much broader than just these urban me megacities. So that's important to keep in mind. So how am I structuring the, which innovative strategies to pull out? Well, the Partnership for Dengue Control, or PDC, which was previously the Vaccines to Vaccinate initiative set up by uh, Remy Tussaud and, and Dwayne Gubler, the, the Vaccines to, to Vaccinate, uh, uh, in a, the endeavor actually has been restructured. Now it's Partnership for Dengue Control. We met a few years back to talk about the status of dengue vector control and, and what will happen when dengue vaccines become available and marketed. Because that will shift the thought process around which strategies to use, how to deploy them. And, and so it's going to be very much uh, something that as vector control specialists we need to keep in mind. So at that workshop we outlined of course a conceptual framework for innovation. And if you look at the top of this figure this is the existing methods that are in place for dengue control right now, which we've talked about it's, uh, in many other presentations. And at the bottom are these methods under development. And so this is really where I'm pulling my, my examples from. And the status of these various innovative strategies, which includes both the immature stage and the adult stage, are varied. So rather than going through all of them and just listing them, because the status is very varied on the evaluation and, and demonstration of efficacy, 
I'm moving towards the WHO Veteran Control Advisory Group panel, which takes those strategies that I just showed from the PDC, and, and a lot of the researchers were, are going to VCAG to get guidance on their study design for evaluation efficacy, and that serves as a platform for WHO and VCAG to move towards recommendation of a particular method. So this is uh, the latest VCAG landscape of new paradigms, and this is not just for dengue, it's also for malaria, but many of them are for dengue on this particular graphic. And so these are the ones that I'll be talking about. Uh, attract and kill baits, of course, Wolbachia. Spatial repellents, which is something that I'm more familiar with. Uh, the genetic manipulation of vectors, and then traps. And so there's many examples of those strategies and they, I mentioned again that they, they're in different stages of evaluation. So that phase two and phase three just represents VCAG's um, uh, format for where they are in terms of, of evaluation in the field. So the first example is attractive toxic sugar baits. And this is not necessarily, some, you may think, well, this isn't new. This has been around for decades. And it has, but the, the difference now is that although it's been shown to have success against malaria vectors and sandflies for leishmaniasis, it's now also being used and evaluated for dengue for, against Aedes aegypti. And the attractive toxic sugar baits, that, that strategy is based on, of course, both males and female mosquitoes requiring an energy source sugar. You can attract them with a particular odor cue, and then as they imbibe, that contaminated sugar meal, they will have either slow or fast killing um, actions. So these, these particular sugar baits can either be applied to vegetation in a spray, or they can be coated on particular bait stations. So there's different ways of deploying this particular um, tool. And there's many people that, of course, have been evaluating these. Uh, Gunther M M Mueller was actually uh, one of the leaders in this particular research uh, strategy. And then there's many others that have followed since then. And, and it, uh, they are actually, Rudy Zhu in Florida, are actually, they're actually evaluating this in, in the US as well. Something that's really interesting, too, is that I think as of January, there's a commercial product, Terminex, that is actually an attractive toxic sugar bait. And it's commercially available. So now homeowners and, and, and other groups can actually purchase this and go and spray vegetation in their backyard or particular bait stations. So uh, this is, again, this is the innovation out of the research in terms of taking it to the community members and having ownership at the house level. The next example, which I think most of us may be familiar with already, is Wolbachia. It's the, it's the, the phenomenon of cytoplasmic incompatibility. In, in, in Wolbachia, is a naturally occurring bacterium. It's an endosymbiont in most insect species. It's really unusual that it's not found in Aedes aegypti, which of course is what we're discussing right now for dengue control. But there's been researchers that have found uh, a way and successfully introduced Wolbachia bacterium from Drosophila and Culex into Aedes aegypti. And that's one of the main strategies for control with this particular tool. And cytoplasmic incompatibility, really what that means is that if a female does not have the Wolbachia and mates with a male that does, those eggs that are produced are non-viable. So there will be no progenies, so the population over some period of time will become suppressed. If you have a male and a female that have Wolbachia, those progeny will survive, but they will also contain Wolbachia. Therefore, it will spread and it will replace the population that's in existence. And the same for a female that has Wolbachia, but a male that does not. So uh, that progeny will survive. And why would you want to have replacement versus just suppression? Because Wolbachia has also been found to interrupt dengue virus transmission. It's, it's a relationship between the vector and the virus. So it has a survival impact on the mosquito, but also dengue virus transmission. Uh, in terms of infectivity of that mosquito for transmitting the virus. So there's two strategies for what, using Wolbachia. And the main groups of researchers that are, are looking at those strategies with Wolbachia, it's Stephen Dobson in the U.S. at University of Kentucky. And his group is really involved with suppression. 
So they release males that have Wolbachia into the environment, and when those males mate with females that do not, it is aegypti, that do not have naturally occurring Wolbachia, again, the progeny is suppressed. Whereas Scott O'Neill's group out of Australia is looking at population replacement. They want Wolbachia to spread because they're really focused on the dengue virus transmission interruption. So two different methodologies. And I think Florence already mentioned, but there's been limited field releases uh, from Stephen Dobson's group in the, in the US, but also in French Polynesia. That's more of a research trial uh, uh, valuation. And actually in the US right now in Los Angeles, they're actually at a full scale going around neighborhoods doing open releases of males with Wolbachia and monitoring the vector population density. Scott O'Neill's group has been uh, doing releases for some time as well. Uh, predominantly in Australia, but then has expanded to Vietnam, Indonesia, Brazil, and Colombia. So uh, that he's been involved with those types of evaluations for some time. Again, focused on vector population density, not dengue virus transmission, which is what really I think is the key. The third example that's again at phase three within VCAG is the spatial repellent uh, paradigm. And that's something where I'm Myself and a colleague of mine at University of Notre Dame are actually leaders of a multi-center uh, uh, research program evaluating spatial repellents for public health purposes, specifically malaria and dengue control. Spatial repellents are products, commercially available products, some of them right now. You can think of mosquito coils, but also passive emanators that have, it's a volatile pyrethroid that's applied to these formats. And the difference between a volatile pyrethroid and one that we've been talking about for maybe indoor residual spraying is that it is not residual in a sense of six months, three months. And it's also volatile at lower uh, ambient temperatures. So that way it disperses much broader and further. Uh, and that conceptually would protect a house or a structure that has a spatial repellent by creating this bubble of protection around all of those that are inhabiting that treated space. And the mode, the mode of action is more, more specific than just toxicity. It's at a lower dose of application. It actually involves interruption of detection of the attractant cues of humans or feeding inhibition. So it interrupts a lot of the sensory mechanisms beyond just purely high dose kill. And there's a lot of groups that are involved with actually developing spatial repellent actives that are not, at the moment, uh, available. So it's non-pyrethroid. These are very unique actives that are being um, actually developed in labs. And so we are hoping that by demonstrating public health value, these new actives will be incentives for, for companies to produce and apply so we can move beyond the synthetic chemicals and get into something a little bit more uh, unique. Spatial repellents have already been demonstrated to have an impact on malaria. So again, moving from just vector impact, reduction of biting, to actually reduction of disease. And so we are, we've already completed a trial in Indonesia about four years ago using a transflutherin uh, coil. And we found in that particular uh, study a 52% protective efficacy in the homes of our subjects where we, they were using those products versus a blank. And in the past, Nigel Hill actually at the London School did a, a, a previous trial with, with another product, a spatial repellent product, and found 70% protective efficacy against plasmodium falciparum. This was the incentive for what we're doing right now, which is taking that product and applying it for dengue control. So we're in Iquitos, Peru, and uh, we're doing a randomized cluster trial using a spatial repellent active in a placebo, and that's in partnership with UC Davis in California and the Navy uh, Medical Research Unit in Lima. And that is being rolled out, the intervention is being rolled out as we speak just this week, and so um, our expectation, of course, we, we have a two-year follow-up, and so we'll be doing updates uh, quite often on that particular outcome. We have both epidemiology outcomes, uh, so seroconversions of of our subjects, which are age two to 13 years of age. And then we also have entomology, because of course we want to also try to, to capture the correlates of protection. Is it going to be parity change? Is it going to be density change? What is it that, that will actually inform us on, on um, the entomological correlates? So we'll be updating you on that. 
Example four, self-limiting gene technology. So this, again, within VCAG, um, there is, and I think most of you maybe are familiar with Oxitec, one of the, the main groups that are looking at uh, the Riddle technology, which is the release of insects carrying a dominant lethal. So they're actually involved with taking a genetically engineered male uh, that has a dominant lethal trait that's passed to the female. And they release these males into the environment. And if the, if the offspring, if these larvae in the environment do not have tetracycline, that's the repressor of that genetic activator, if they don't have tetracycline, then the progeny die, either in the larval stage or pupal stage. They have various strains. Oxitec has various strains of their, of their technology that they can use. And so the Oxitec has been involved, of course, with field releases in, in many areas, Brazil being one of them. And they have found uh, through their studies that the, that the actual, the reduction of Aedes aegypti, at least in this particular, this is in Brazil, uh, has been maintained low, even when in the control areas you see a great increase in Aedes aegypti density. So they're seeing that there is efficacy in reducing vector populations, Aedes aegypti populations in their study sites. And they have been expanding their operations. So they started doing releases in Grand Cayman now, uh, the Cay other Cayman Islands previously. Panama and Key West, they're moving towards, they're just waiting for certain approvals to come in. <laughs> for the release the, of, of these uh, organisms. And I, I think, yeah, they were just expanding in Brazil to be able to cover 300,000 people. So they're just beginning to ramp up their production in Brazil to be able to meet this demand. So it's, it's, it's becoming quite impressive. But again, more related to vector density monitoring than actual disease case changes or seroconversions. So that's the one catch that I think Florence already mentioned with this. And uh, I believe this is the last example I have was alticidal oviposition traps. There's many different types of oviposition traps that are, that are available. Most of them were used for surveillance, and they still are. But again, through VCAG, there's other groups coming forward for the acceptance of these traps for actual prevention of disease and control, not just surveillance. And so as I mentioned, there's many traps. I'm just going to talk briefly about into trap and ALOT. The INTO trap actually has a, a series of, of chemicals and non-chemical uh, actives that they use to enhance their, their strategy. So it, they have a simple, again for Aedes aegypti, simple oviposition trap, which is typically constructed out of this plastic type of black uh, structure here. But for the INTO trap, they've combined silica powder with um, entomopathogenic fungi. So that's another type of innovative strategy for larval control. And the fungi actually also kills the adults, and it can interrupt um, blood feeding behavior. It has also been found to interrupt malaria transmission. And so that's, they've put silica in this uh, particular, there's several, but this one particular type of ento, uh, uh, patho pathogenic uh, fungi in the trap. And then they've combined it with paraproxifen so that when the female leaves, they transfer paraproxifen to other larval sites, and the fungi will have a slow killing effect on the adult, so the adult eventually dies after it's been transferring paraproxifen. And the larvae are killed because they actually also have, um, uh, they have other types of, of uh, actives in here. And what's really interesting, that's why VCAG was interested, really interested in this particular product, is because they've, they've they have an innovative electrostatic gauze. So it's actually Bart Knowles is, is one of the, uh, the team members of this, of this particular product. And they've developed this electrostatic technology. And what that does is it enhances the uptake of that mosquito to make contact with the treated surface of that gauze where the paraproxifen is. And they're actually testing this for bed nets as well. Because rather than just having the mosquito touch and leave, it's, it's actually driving them to have the dose required for killing. So again, thinking of beyond just the active being innovative, it's the delivery of the active. So it was, it was quite fascinating. And then ALOT uh, is also up for review for full recommendation. ALOT is out of um, Don Wesson's group at Tulane University with her collaborators. 
they evaluated that particular um, overtrap in Iquitos, Peru. They combined both entomological and epidemiological outcome measures. And so within their study design, uh, they looked at core treatments and in the buffer area, and they found a reduction of Aedes aegypti in the areas where the ALAT traps were. And beyond that, they also found a 74% protective efficacy against dengue uh, as, a, as an indicator. They use cases, dengue cases. And so there was uh, some indication of an impact on the epidemiological outcome. So these two traps are moving forward quite, quite well within the VCAG paradigm pathway. But as I mentioned, there's a lot of additional tools. And so uh, this still is not all inclusive, but I just want to make sure that it's, it's understood that we talked about insecticide treated materials. Florence had mentioned that. Uh, new chemical insecticides, that is related to the electrophysiological work that's being done by many researchers with looking at um, odorant recept receptors and olfactory sensory neurons using RNAi technology to knock out certain genes and look to see what happens and then replacing them with other particular uh, segments of, of genetic markers that we know will have some impact on the mosquito. Oxitec is, is now has a new strain, flightless female. So they're moving towards developing that for release where the females survive, but they just can't fly. So the progeny is not related to uh, suppression of, of a population. It's more of just if they can't fly, they won't be able to mate. They can't have sugar meals and, and blood sources. So that's one that they're moving towards. And then molecular insecticides. This is a big field that's really exciting in terms of looking at gene drives. So there's uh, media has been around for some time already. It's a, it's a naturally occurring gene drive system. But with this new technology of CRISPR-Cas9, which makes it more precise in cutting, more precise in annealing those joints to your inserted segments, uh, the, it's really becoming a fast track for, for new ways of controlling uh, mosquito vectors. And then paratransgenesis is another type of molecular methodology. Taking the microbiota found within these vectors, manipulating those biotic uh, DNA to express some type of an active within the mosquito or the vector to actually have an impact on its transmission capability. So it's, it's not necessarily genetic modification of the mosquito, it's genetic modification of the microbiota within the mosquito that's causing some impact on transmission. So there's a lot happening with the molecular uh, technology. But regardless of, are we done? Yep, okay. So regardless, we have a lot of challenges. The big one is, of course, dengue virus impact on any of those particular um, strategies. And also, we should not forget that there is a dengue vaccine currently available and being marketed and being used in limited, in limited uh, populations. But Mexico has just licensed it. They just agreed to it. Um, also Brazil, El Salvador, and the Philippines. So it's only Sanofi Pasteur has, they are now marketing it, it's very limited. But so we need to keep in mind that when it comes to improving dengue control, we need to address insecticide resistance, but we also need to think about innovations towards when vaccines are deployed. How will that or not um, affect how we deliver our, our vector control tools? Okay, I thank you very much, I'll end there, thank you.